Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, Marie Paul asked that I introduce myself at least briefly. I am I'm a former mathematician who drifted into computer science and began doing graphics. I've messed around with computer graphics for uh, a quarter century, a, a long time. Um, and today, I'm mostly going to talk to you not so much about modeling, but about non-photorealistic and expressive rendering, partly because we have a longer history in that area. And I think we can learn something from that history for what will happen as expressive modeling becomes more natural. I want to talk in particular about a change in the field of expressive rendering that's occurred recently. And in doing so, I'm actually going to perhaps say some unkind things about earlier work. And I'm always reluctant to you know, say that was a terrible idea. The good news is that most of the work I'm going to criticize will be either my own or my students or that of good friends of mine, and I hope they won't take offense. So I want to start by setting context. Um, expressive or non-photorealistic rendering aims to make things that are not like photos but are more, well, not photorealistic. And if you look at the state of the art in computer graphics in 1977, you might say, that's not very photorealistic. You've already succeeded. You know, we can already make pictures that aren't photorealistic. Um, you're, you're a long way from realism. But then again, we were also a long way from doing anything that resembled art or anything that resembled even photorealistic art like this. But I want to point out that even way back at the very start of graphics in Sutherland's sketchpad system in 1967, there was this realization that making something that didn't look exactly real, but instead had some um, abstracted quality to it, might have some value. Let me jump forward to 1989. So the world has improved a lot. Photorealistic rendering is all the rage. And um, I just, this uh, diagram from a paper in 1989 amused me because it, it looks as though it might have been hand drawn. So although we'd moved forward, we hadn't moved forward all that far. Um, but what about the actual pictures being made? Well, um, they still weren't terribly photorealistic either. But the fact is, photorealism was making a lot of progress. I, I chose 1989 because that was when, at sitting at um, Brown University and playing around in the graphics lab when I was supposed to be doing mathematics, I, I got obsessed with pointillism. This uh, picture by Seurat seemed really interesting to me. I mean, what can I say? There were lots and lots of dots in that picture, and we had just bought a frame buffer. And it had lots and lots of dots, too. In fact, it had maybe 200,000 pixels. It was a big deal. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I can mimic what Seurat was doing. It, it turns out that I couldn't. Um, I, there were a couple of problems. One thing is that I didn't actually have source images. I didn't have a, I didn't have a photograph from which to make a pointillist image because there were no consumer digital cameras at that point. Um, more important than that, Seurat was doing something, something much more subtle than color dithering tricks. His dot placement actually matters in these paintings. And unfortunately, with the frame buffer, I was constrained. The dots had to go where the pixels were. The good news is that um, just as I was trying to figure out how to make Seurat-like paintings, some other people who were a lot cleverer um, were doing even better things. So the first of these was Paul Haberly, who was working at SGI, where they had really fast computers, and he had access to some of the first digital cameras around. And he made this really great paint program where you could take an image and essentially take each pixel and replace it with a small stroke of paint. And by doing this over and over with some guidance for directions of the paint strokes, make things that actually looked kind of art-like. And this was, this was very different from what we'd seen in computer graphics. 
But he went beyond that. He didn't just do it with imagery. He also said, you know, if I had the sort of 3D models that I was typically using in computer graphics, I could make a renderer that rather than making this picture in the upper left, creates a picture like the one in the lower right. That is, he could go directly from an abstract mathematical model to a painting. Even more exciting than that, though, for me, was this paper by Takahashi and Saito, who showed that by using information from the depth in an image, the distance of each pixel from the camera, you could enhance a rendered image with lots of highlights here, essentially discontinuities in the derivatives of the depth, and produce something like the drawing at the lower right, in which you've enhanced a photographic image with the kinds of lines that might have been added by a technical illustrator. But once you've had this idea that looking at the depth image and computing derivatives on it might give you other information, they, they, they went beyond that and said, gosh, anything where we have information on a per pixel basis, we can experiment with taking derivatives and combining them. And uh, you could do this, for instance, with the parametric coordinates for things like a torus, at which point they were able to say, well, let's take the longitude and latitude coordinates and take derivatives of those and threshold on them. And the next thing you know, they'd produce these beautiful cross-hatched images of a torus. These were really these were really stunning in this time. They were, they were some of the most lovely images produced by computer graphics in that day. There were, I want to say, there, were, there was enormous progress going on in photorealistic rendering at the same time. Kajia's paper on the rendering equation had come out a few years earlier, and we had now finally a mechanism for rendering very, very complex lighting effects like caustics. And, um, was, there was clearly great progress happening. On the other hand, rendering those took hours and hours or days, while, uh, whereas producing these pictures took only half an hour, perhaps. So those, those two papers were really the start of a lot of work in, the, in this area. But given the rate at which photorealism was improving, you might ask, why bother with this? After all, the photorealistic guys are gonna get this right. They're gonna be able to make perfect photographs. Why continue going on and doing expressive rendering? I'm gonna hold off on answering that for a few minutes to let you think about it and uh, kind of veer off on a bit of a tangent here. Why do artists draw? So you, you have to make a picture of something. Why do you draw rather than putting down a whole lot of pixels. I, I've actually asked some artists why they draw. And it turns out to be, it's a tricky thing that, you know, they and I speak a different language. But after a certain amount of interpretation, there, there are a couple of good reasons. One of them is sometimes when you draw something, you may be able to express a concept that goes beyond the literal light coming from the thing being drawn you may be able to better communicate something about whatever it is that you're drawing by omitting detail of one sort or another and essentially by doing abstraction. Another reason to draw is actual efficiency, right? If you, if you have to make a picture, would you rather draw three or four strokes or a million dots? Well, of course you'd rather draw three or four strokes. It's, it's just easier if you're an artist. Now, you know, they, an artist has a time budget the same as everyone else, so being efficient really is a critical, a critical matter. So once you've decided that drawing might be a good idea, how do you know what to draw? This is a question that's, that's puzzled me for a while. Well, one answer for how you know what to draw is practice. You, you try it. <laughs> and eventually you can make a picture that looks like the thing you want to depict. Um, another is that you can look at what other artists have drawn and use their experience to help inform what you do. Um, and I wanna, what is that experience? What, what is it that artists have been doing all these years? And the answer is they've been reverse engineering our visual system. 
They've been figuring out how strokes on a piece of paper can make us perceive something. By sort of, by experimentation, you know, this didn't make people see that thing, so I won't draw it next time. It's really quite, quite remarkable, the body of experience that's collected in the skills of artists. Um, there's, their goal really is to create in the viewer's mind the sensation of seeing something as efficiently as possible. I, I want to digress just for one moment a little further and ask a question for which I do not know the answer, which is, how do we humans actually make sense of drawings? So we're, we, normally use, we normally use our eyes to take the light arriving at our eyes and transform it into some understanding of the world. So as I look at you, I see a person. And you know, our eyes are pretty good at that. Now, if you look at this picture, there's a certain pattern of light arriving at your eyes. And it is not the pattern of light that has ever been produced by any two people standing next to each other. And yet, I expect that all of you looking at this little white rectangle here, see two people. <laughs> How is that working? I, I have no idea. And you know, I've, I've gone and read stuff from the vision literature and they say, oh, you know, there are these various steps with edge detection and things like that. But it's sort of, that helps explain how you might see things in the real world, but how you make sense of a drawing is a separate matter. Um, Magritte wondered about this too, right? He, he, he observed that when we look at a painting of a pipe, we see both the painting and the pipe itself at the same time, and there's this peculiar thing of seeing two things at once. And, you know, I, you can make some conjectures. When we look at, look at a drawing like this, mostly we're doing some sort of inference from contours to forming a belief that we're seeing a seagull or some sort of bird. When we look at an image like this one, well, perhaps it's a little bit more like the light field that we might actually see if we stood in this village and looked at these houses. If you blur your eyes a little bit, the darker areas, you know, the areas with more marks on them seem darker and the area with fewer marks seem lighter. And it sort of might resemble a a bad photograph of the thing if you blur your eyes enough. But for something like this Ralph Steadman drawing, it, it's hard for me to imagine what our visual system might be doing in order to understand what we're seeing here. So let me, let me get quite specific. One of the things that our visual system does is to detect edges in imagery or edges in the light field that is areas, edges between light and dark regions, say. So if I have a drawing and there's a pen stroke on it, which I'll take a little piece of, this green line here, what my visual system ought to do is detect two edges, one between the top white area and the green and another between the green and the white. But in fact, when we look at drawings, we don't say, oh, each stroke of the pencil is really two edges. We see it as a single edge and infer that it's a contour of some object. And I have, a, I have a crazy conjecture about this, and probably there's someone here in the audience who knows much more about the visual system than I do who can help me out with it. Um, so I, my, my crazy idea is that, um, as I said, the human visual system does processing on imagery to detect edges, and then it takes those little bits of edges and assembles them into contours, and then it takes those contours and uses them to make hypotheses about whole objects. But in that process, there's a huge amount of feedback. So the, the portion of the brain that takes edge bits and assembles them into contours might find several edge bits that form one contour and some more edge bits that form another and say, oh, right there, there ought to be a little more contour. Maybe the edge detectors missed that. 
And it actually feeds back information to the edge detection portion of the brain and says, if we increase the probability of detecting an edge here, would you, um, would you then believe that there was one there? And the edge detectors might say yes or they might say no, and then that helps the contour generating section determine whether there really is a continuous contour or not. Um, my conjecture is that that feedback down to the lower level system actually comes in the form of sort of pretend inputs to the uh, edge detectors themselves. So that is the contour system says to the edge detectors, here's what I've got so far. And it presents those essentially as inputs to the edge detectors and that what I've got so far as an input provokes the response of increasing the likelihood of detecting the missing edge bits. So my conjecture is that drawings mimic that feedback. That when you see a drawing, the effect it has on the edge detection mechanism is to provoke a response similar to the one that would have been gotten if those contours had been provided as feedback by the higher level part of the visual system. So that essentially the drawing lets you jumpstart the visual recognition process. Now, I should say, I, I talked to Doug DiCarlo about this, and Doug is someone who's done a lot of work in non-photorealistic rendering and in computer vision, and he knows a lot more about vision than I do, and, and he doesn't believe this at all. So um, you should definitely doubt this conjecture, but, but something's going on, and I should say, you know, on the other hand, while he doesn't believe this at all, he also can't explain in the slightest why it is that we can make sense of drawings. So, you know, I have a bad conjecture, and he has no conjecture at all. <laughs> Okay, back to the question, why do expressive rendering? So let me, let me give a cynical answer, because at the time it made really cool looking pictures and you get your papers into cigarette. I see Ariel's agreeing with me here. He thinks this is a fine reason to do non-photorealistic rendering. But perhaps a more, a more serious answer is it may be a way to provoke the response you want in the visual system more efficiently than conventional rendering. And it's also because art, as we see it, has some power to, to cause us to perceive things that we don't necessarily get from photographs. And that can be useful in producing illustrations of ideas, in telling stories, in making abstractions and helping us focus our attention on part of an image. Um, the other thing is saying that David Byrne remark, which I really like, he says now that perfect design is possible with the click of a, a mouse, the industrialized world has become nostalgic for imperfect design. As computer-aided everything takes over our lives, we begin to realize little by little what's missing from the high-tech world. We realize that a crooked line sometimes has more soul than a perfectly straight one. So that's, that might be a good reason to do non-photorealistic rendering as well. There's a nice uh, tree made by Oliver Doyson. And uh, I think, in a way, this picture of a tree communicates more about a tree than a photograph might. And it doesn't really matter that not every leaf is correct or that the shadow isn't perfect. Somehow, you, you see more tree-ness there than you might in a photograph. So with all that in mind, let me do a very quick survey of what happened in expressive rendering after those 1990 papers. And this isn't a survey of everything that happened, it's a survey of some selected things because it would be far too long to go on all of the things. So one thing is, Winkenbach and Salison made these really beautiful pen and ink drawings. And we said, wow, it's gorgeous. In fact, I remember one person saying, in a, in a review session, these are, these are the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen made by computer graphics. Um, Barb Meyer did this great work on painterly animation in which she said you can actually not just make paintings the way Haberly did, but you can make an animation in which every frame looks painted. And to do that, she had to, to deal with a bunch of problems. 
how to deal with the fact that paint strokes are actually complex objects themselves, that strokes that you make on an object when you do an animation, which stroke is in front, change, tends to change, so you get one paint stroke jumping out in front of another. That's a, that's a problem because our eyes, it turns out, are really sensitive to changes. And so if you have something jumping back and forth from one to the other, terrible things happen. You end up focusing on the places that are flickering rather than on the overall picture. Um, strokes in a painting tend to be about a certain size. And if in a movie of a painted world you zoom in, then the strokes get really big and that doesn't look right and it doesn't feel like a painted world anymore. So she had a bunch of, bunch of challenges. Um, but part of the dirty little secret of this paper really is that Barb actually has a really good artistic eye. If I had done this paper with exactly the same technical solutions, it would have been terrible. Barb actually has a painting background and she sort of really understands something about the visual appearance. The same thing's true with this computer generated water color paper by Cassidy Curtis. Cassidy's also a fairly talented artist already. But, you know, it was another medium and the watercolor looked great. Um, Mike Kowalski and uh, a bunch of us did this paper on making pictures like the ones that appear in Dr. Seuss's books. J.D. Northrup did a nice thing on animating um, line drawings. And in animating line drawings, there's the same problem of flickering stuff and Mike uh, JD figured out that if you tapered the ends of things and faded the ends of things, it helped reduce the visual system artifacts. Another important thing, though, is he, he had this realization that strokes like these that have semantic content, you know, this isn't just a contour, it's actually part of a buckle for this sandal. It was really important to keep them tied to the object, that is, the semantics of the object and the actual strokes that you drew had to be related. You couldn't just treat the object as geometric. You had to actually know that different parts were different things. Um, so one medium after another. Um, mosaics, charcoal. At some point, we, we got really good at imitating all of these artistic media. In fact, there was sort of an industry of figuring out what medium hasn't been done yet, and maybe I could write a paper about that. All right. When I say we got really good at it, I don't actually think that's true. So have, there's this way of creating text. You go out and you take some body of text, and you take three words at a time three adjacent words, it's called a trigram, and you make a record of all the trigrams in your text. And then you can create new text by picking one trigram and then fitting another one next to it that happens to match the second and third words and another one after that. And pretty soon, you can produce something like this. You look at this and it looks like text until you read it and then it's sort of nonsense. That's kind of what we were doing with non-photorealistic rendering. We were getting something that kind of looked like a painting or looked like a mosaic, but people who actually paint or who actually make mosaics look at this stuff and say, no, 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 that's all wrong. <laughs> so we, we, we managed to copy sort of just the surface veneer of these things. And it was... Uh, you know, it was, it's a real problem. And I don't want to say that all of those papers were worthless. Every one of them encountered real challenges and addressed those challenges with real innovation. But in our rush to find the next medium to imitate and to get over the hurdles of what the imitation entailed, we failed to actually see the value in the challenges that we were encountering. All of the problems we encountered in making these different versions of expressive rendering were, were telling us one thing, and it was that the underlying media that we were imitating were really not right 
for a computer-based expressive rendering system. And, you know, we just kept doing new ones rather than saying, what's going wrong with all of them? Well, it's the wrong idea. So silhouettes were hard because of this sort of squirmy, wiggly endpoint thing. You know, Dr. Seuss was tough because every single thing we wanted to do in Dr. Seuss needed a separate bit of code for how to render it. Watercolor was hard because it was really tough to control the simulation to make it paint what you wanted. Mosaics were hard because the edges of the tiles didn't match up with edges. You know, there were all of these problems. And um, so if all of these media are bad, why is it that artists use them? So why do we, why do we use charcoal to make drawings? You know, if you, if you ask artists who've got lots of experience, they say, well, charcoal's great. You can draw lines with it. You can smudge it with your thumb and make nice gradients and things like this. But um, my, my conjecture is that the real answer lies right here. One morning after the fire had been burning, there was a partly burned stick, and somebody found out you could draw with it. And it made a permanent mark, and it was, it's great. You know, it was right there. That's really the reason we use charcoal. It's readily available. It does the job well enough. In the same way, you know, why do we use ochre clay? Well, because it was readily available. I think if you'd given the artists at Lesco a nice box of oil paints and some brushes, whoever made these paintings would have been delighted to use those oil paints. It just happened to be that the ochre clay was available. Being available isn't quite enough. Something has to have better properties than that. If availability were enough, then, you know, making funny little hand drawings like this, you know, to make pretty uh, shadows would become a major art form, and, and it really hasn't. Um, so permanence is an important characteristic, and the ability to express a really wide variety of things rather than just a limited variety of funny shadows like this. Um, so this is supposed to be a seminar about modeling, and I've talked about rendering a lot. And I want to go off and talk on modeling just for a moment. A student of mine, Tinsley Galleon, back in 1992, did a project on, um, on sculpting. And, and the world at this point in computer graphics was mostly making things that looked like they could be manufactured in a machine shop. There were cylinders, there were cubes, Sometimes there were tubular things, but mostly it was the, the objects that were most closely related to computer-aided manufacturing, that was sort of the world. And there was some effort that had been made to do freeform deformations, but even those freeform deformations ended up looking kind of like the spline objects you see in today's drawing programs. And Tinsley's idea was to say, let's throw all that out and just actually do something like sculpting. We'll represent a volume in space by recording many, many voxels and say, you know, all those voxels are full of clay, and then you could use a tool to carve away the clay. And we had a 3D mouse at that point. It was a terrible 3D mouse. It, you'd hold it steady, and the cursor would jump around like mad. So the drawings, the things we made tended to be kind of crude. But you know, this was a very different feel from everything else that was going on. Now, various people we showed this to said, that's not really sculpting. When you sculpt with clay, clay is this wonderful material and you can squeeze it and it deforms and things like that and, and you're just working with this block of numbers. I, so I, I think that was a, a real mistake we, we listened to them and we sort of apologized in the paper for the fact that we weren't really using clay. And I think that um, the, the peculiar characteristics of clay, that you can squeeze it and deform it, those are something that people who work with clay learn to do. But a lot of times you squeeze your piece of clay and unfortunately a crack appears and then you have to fix it. It's, it's not really an ideal medium, it's just something we're pretty used to. The underlying medium here 
this volumetric array actually has a lot of nice properties. Funny cracks don't appear in it at random. It doesn't change shape when it dries out the way clay does. Um, so in fact, not imitating clay in many ways made this a better medium rather than a worse one for creating sculptures. I, I should argue really that maybe the most important thing and the most important difference between this and clay was the existence of undo. Undo is a huge step, but, but undo is just one of many things that's on the palette of most paint programs. And one of the ideas we had was that re you could use lots of tools the way lots of paint programs had many tools in them at the time. And you could do things like, oh, take a region of your sculpture and move something over it that smoothed it out. It both lowered the, the bumps and raised up the valleys. Yeah, that, was just a certain, that was just applying a filter to the volume array. But it was a tool unlike any physical tool for working with clay. But it let you do things in your sculpture that you couldn't have done with physical clay. And in fact, all of the things that were available in paint programs were pretty easy to understand by users who'd played with those already. And people playing with the program would constantly say, well, couldn't you add this tool as well? It was um, really, we were treating this voxel array, as a, this material representation, as a new medium. It was really different from the old one of clay. I, about, about the same time this came out, a few years later, there's this great program called Kid Picks. I, don't, I think you can still buy Kid Picks, and if you haven't played with it, you really should. You may look at this and think, oh, come on, that's a, that's a hideous picture, and I completely agree. But let me, let me tell you a little bit about how you make this hideous picture. In Kid Picks, you, you select some painting tool like, oh, I don't know, this one looks like somebody selected a magenta circle, and you take it and you drag it across the screen and it lays down a bunch of magenta circles. How many? Oh, as many as it can, whatever the refresh rate of the whole interaction cycle is. And you can click a single magenta circle and just put a few of them here and there. Whoever did this put a white dot there and clicked on a rose or a flower and put one of those here and a butterfly object. You can make lots of butterflies. Um, you could also do things like grab a piece of your current composition and say, oh, make a rubber stamp out of that and put copies of it everywhere. What, what is this? You know, this is crazy. But my kids totally loved this program. And, and the guy who designed it had sort of this single-minded single view of things, which was you should be able to do stuff. It doesn't matter that it be consistent. It doesn't matter that it be like any other medium you use. You should always be able to do anything. And it turns out kids just loved it. Um, you know, I made this. It's awesome, <laughs> right? Uh, only the artist would think this was awesome, I grant you, but it really is kind of fun. Um, if you spent a little more time and worked more carefully, you could get more serious and make something Oh, somewhere between Gauguin and Henri Rousseau. But, but most folks didn't. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite tools illustrated. This is a tool where you, you draw a line, and as you do, little drops of ink fall down from it. And if you're drawing fast, they drop only a little, and if you're drawing slowly, they drop a lot. This isn't, this isn't an imitation of any real medium. And yet someone has found a way to use this silly little tool to communicate something about how he was feeling at the time. I, this idea, by the way, you, you could easily add to Kid Picks a tool where as you draw, little sprouts come up, and then you could very rapidly make a garden. It, it really, the, the potential once you free yourself from thinking about imitating some particular thing and just say, let's try stuff, is really remarkable. And I, I claim that this was really kind of the first 
hint of a revolution, and, and I never felt it. I thought it was just a cool program that my kids liked. But the idea that you treat a composition on a computer as a new medium and something you could experiment with was really exciting. And that notion's been continued recently. And, and it's my hope that future expressive rendering and modeling can, and animation papers will actually follow that trend. So let me, let me start with a small example. Xtune, it's a little shader. It's an idea of saying, we can do non-photorealistic shading using computer graphics hardware. That's a pretty straightforward idea. In this picture, you can see the full-size sculpture has got tune shading. It's done in three different levels. But once it fades into the distance, you no longer want those hard lines and you want a smoother variation in shading. And this transition from this detailed version to this smoothed out version happens automatically with Xtune. And the way it does is the whole image is created using a texture lookup. And the texture lookup involves how brightly lit the object is. So bright sides get yellow, the dark side gets red, and the distance between the viewer and the object. So things that are nearby are drawn from red to yellow, but in a way that has sharp transitions. Things that are far away get drawn in a red to yellow gradient that doesn't have sharp transitions. Well, once again, once you have this idea that you could use as an index into a texture lookup, not the X, the U and V coordinates on a surface, but some other properties in the scene, you can just go wild. You know, the, the coordinates that feed into either of these two things can be almost anything. And you have this ability to change how a scene looks by repainting this texture image. You have this sort of indirect control of the whole scene all at once. It's really, it's a different medium that essentially depends on the nature of the graphics hardware to make it work. It's one where they said, let's think about what, what's easy to do on a computer and make that particularly simple for an artist to manipulate. There's an even more extreme example of this that comes from Orsan and her co-authors in the paper on diffusion curves. They basically said, we know that our eyes are sensitive to edges. So how about if we make a tool that lets us paint with edges? So the idea here is that an artist can draw some shape like this and control exactly what the shape should be and then indicate what the color should be on either side of that edge and how sharp the transition between the two sides should be. And the computer then solves a partial differential equation to get a color field that matches the specifications here. But the thing to note is that the actual original edge doesn't appear in the image. The only reason you see the edge in the image is because of a sharp transition between two different color regions. So it's a really nice idea of saying, let's Let's use as our primitive for drawing the thing that our visual system is most sensitive to. At the same time, there was sort of a similar paper done, or a paper with similar ideas done by McCann and Pollard, where they said, you know, let's, let's take imagery to start with. By the way, the, the notion of creating a composition starting from photographs is pretty similar to the whole idea of sampling in music. And I think that the two have, have sort of comparable potential for really interesting things. But part of what they did was say, you know, you could actually use the information in an image to create new imagery. So they took a section of this drain pipe and copied it over here to make this drain pipe. And that copy was truly just saying, I want the gradient of the image from here to be placed over here. And then I want the system to solve this PDE that computes a new image that has the gradient that I specified. And they also used this to remove the wall that's at the left. You can see that that wall has gone away by a little bit of overpainting. 
if we were if we were writing that sculpt program with the silly fish today, we'd probably 3D print the results, as Marie Paul said. But but we live in a world where we can actually print much more than just shapes. We can print textures or micro textures, and the creative tools that should be associated with those are still to be developed. And we can also invent new kinds of output. And I I think that like the, you know. The, just to digress for a moment, the history of music, a wonderful thing happened when the piano was developed. Composers said, hey, I can write cool stuff for this piano because it can play loud and soft. And then they wrote new music, and then the people working on the piano said, we could add another pedal. And one thing led to another, and there was this enormous development because the technology and the creativity worked with each other. And I think the same thing's true in computer graphics and expressive rendering and modeling as well. So I want to I want to conclude here by showing you two bits of video. One of them from an installation done by by Scott Snibby. Um, we'll see if I can see if we can make this work. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. to the internet. Okay, um, the miracle of technology has failed me here, folks. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to have to leave you in, I'll, I'll describe what this is rather than actually showing you. So there's um, this is an installation and above this platform, way up high, is a video camera looking down and a projector. And as people walk onto this platform, the video camera recognizes where they are, and, and the projector then draws a line halfway between them. And so the result is that as people move around here, the Voronoi diagram of regions closest to each person is constantly changing. Suddenly, your, your awareness of your personal space and your interaction with other people becomes visible. It's really fascinating. When you install this in different parts of the world, you get very different reactions. The, the cultural, cultural notions of what's appropriate personal space and how we interact with it, when you suddenly make it manifest in front of you, it, people react very differently in different cultures. Um, in, in a very different domain, I, I, don't, I won't be able to show you the video of this. There's a great new technology where somebody said, let's take a steel ball and roll it around in a tray of sand. That makes little tracks in the sand. And then he's put a computer, a, a robotic arm underneath this steel ball with a magnet on it so he can drag the ball around in the sand. And the robotic arm moves it around and the ball draws things in the sand. Now that is a totally different medium from a bitmap or anything else and the nature of the medium changes what you think about what you could possibly illustrate. You can get some relief, but not a lot. And it, it gives you a kind of different feel for what might be possible. Uh, and I, I will, in the slides for the uh, eventual web page for this, I will include the link to this. I, I want to conclude by saying, stop imitating old media. <sighs> Instead, Think about what it is you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to produce, and let the potential of computer-based media actually guide you. And your knowledge of the visual, and, and in the case of modeling, the tactile system, guide what you think about you might be possible. Um, there's, there's one other question, which is, I think, part of what Mark will be addressing in his talk, which is, what's the, what's the right way to think about output, new kinds of output. And I, there's, there's a lot to discuss there, and I, I look forward to what Mark has to say about it. I want to, I want to mention one last kind of output. Um, so 3D printing is, is kind of cool, but as many of you know, it's sort of slow, too. There's this nice paper a couple of years ago by Stephanie Mueller on um, wire print, which is essentially printing wireframe pictures of things physically printing wireframe objects. And just, 
So I went and visited folks at Cornell who had some of these wire print objects. And I picked up one of them, which was a printing of a human hand. And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at it and turning it around. And it's made out of this, this somewhat hard plastic, and I wanted to see how flexible it was, which is always a little risky because you might break it. But I knew they could print another one. And so I, I took the thing, and I held this hand between, you know, held it with my other hand, and I, I squeezed a little, and it deformed. But a really cool thing happened. When I squeezed it, it deformed, and some parts moved more than others. How come? Well, because of the connections, right? Those zigzags connected this compression more to one finger than to another. So here's a potential new medium. You take something like this, and you decide which connections to make in the graph so that you can cause whatever motion you happen to want as a result of printing the thing. So now you can actually think about printing both geometry and motion. Well, differential motion. You probably can't make really complex motion quite yet. You know, all you need to have for that is a lot of experience with graph theory and a little bit about simulation of networks of rods and things like that. And there's, there's an opportunity for something kind of cool here. And any of you are welcome to pursue this if you want, because I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe if somebody wants to do it jointly, I'd be happy to participate. So I just, I want you to think ideas like this are just, they're out there all over the place. And I want you to, the, the real, the possibility for these things comes from thinking not of imitating old media, but instead of thinking of these computer-based things as new media in their own right. Thank you very much.